A series about someone who examines tropes would not be complete without examining a few tropes of her own. There is a trope to Tropes vs. Women, and it goes something like this. Introduce the trope, and then state the negative effects of the trope, and then conclude by wagging her finger at the writers. A trope is a common pattern in a story, or a recognizable attribute in a character that conveys information to the audience. The Manic Pixie perpetuates the myth of women as caregivers at our very core. So Hollywood writers, let me remind you that women are not here for your inspiration, celebration, or to coax you out of your troubles. Feminist frequency tends to draw a straight line through things which aren't always so straight in reality. Her approach makes quite a few assumptions about how stories are interpreted, so let's examine that for a moment. I've been told that feminism from its second wave onward was highly influenced by post-structuralist thinkers. Some of what I've read by feminists seems to confirm this, but feminist frequency videos make me seriously question this claim. Allow me to use Wikipedia to explain this because it is a succinct and commonly accessible source. Quote, the author's intended meaning is secondary to the meaning that the reader perceives. So, Hollywood writers. Also, the author's identity as a stable self with a single discernible intent is a fictional construct. Writers are using the women in refrigerators trope. Post structuralism rejects the idea of a literary text having a singular purpose, a singular meaning, or a singular existence. Instead, every individual reader creates a new and individual purpose, meaning, and existence for a given text. This trope is used in order to reinforce... Now, I've never really thought of myself as a post-structuralist. I find Derrida aggravating as hell to read. Ah. But the general point is less esoteric than we might think. Simply put, everything is a matter of interpretation, and a text lends itself to multiple interpretations even if a story attempts to promote a single interpretation. A great example here would be a movie script. When a movie script is taken by a director and a film crew and made into a movie, they are creating one possible interpretation. You could give the same movie script to 20 different directors and come up with 20 distinctly different movies. But let's use the old story of the tortoise and the hare as an example, because it's one of those stories with a little moral lesson at the end, which is supposed to serve as the orthodox interpretation of the story. A turtle and a rabbit have a race. The rabbit is much faster and zooms ahead of the turtle, only to stop and take a break at the finish line, thinking as the race in the bag. The turtle keeps moving the whole time, in spite of being slow, ends up winning the race. The moral of the story is that slow and steady wins the race, or so we were all told as children. But is that the only possible interpretation of the story? Of course not. Other interpretations include, there'll be plenty of time to slack off once you've won the race, hubris will be your downfall, slow and steady wins the race if your opponent is overconfident, etc. The point is that multiple interpretations are possible, even contradictory interpretations. The author might intend for us to believe one interpretation, that slow and steady wins the race, but that is secondary to how the reader actually interprets it. To take this away from children's stories to something seemingly more relevant, let's examine religion. Interpretation plays a central role in religion. Let's use the Bible and Christianity as an example. For centuries, Christianity in Western Europe was dominated by the Catholic Church. Catholicism represents a hierarchical institution responsible for interpreting the Bible for believers. In theory, all Catholics are supposed to believe the interpretation of the Bible given to them by the Church. This was until Martin Luther came along nailing things to doors and starting Protestantism by claiming that all believers could interpret the Bible for themselves. This would lead over the course of the next several centuries to the fracturing of Christianity into thousands of different denominations. How? through the magic of interpretation. Theoretically, everyone who reads the Bible could come up with a unique interpretation of the text. A denomination of Christianity is, and this is a phrase feminists love, a social construct which uses forms of social influence to impose a singular interpretation on a group of people. It usually relies on a centralized interpreter such as a preacher and a certain hermeneutical approach. Hermeneutics is a way of interpreting a text. Fundamentalists attempt to interpret the Bible literally. So you might be thinking at this point, oh, this is so fascinating, but what the hell does it have to do with feminist frequency videos? The basic point here is that things are interpreted in numbers of ways depending on who is doing the interpreting. Feminist frequency is choosing to emphasize a single potential interpretation, usually phrasing it as the only possible interpretation. Moreover, she's attempting to place more responsibility on writers for something they don't actually control, namely the interpretation. The claim she most commonly uses is that something reinforces a stereotype, but I think this idea merits close 
examination, let's use the Manic Pixie Dream Girl as an example. In a Manic Pixie Dream Girl movie, you have a character dynamic between a depressed boy and a manic girl. The female character attempts to cheer up the male character, and the problem feminist frequency has with it is that the Manic Pixie perpetuates the myth of women as caregivers at our very core. But how do we arrive at that conclusion? Bear in mind, in these movies we are seeing individual women act in a particular way. First, let's examine certain alternative interpretations. As we know, all people, regardless of gender, are capable of the entire range of human behaviors. And these Manic Pixies are behaving in one of the many possible ways human beings could behave. Or we could say that this behavior is not attributable to nature, but the way that women have been socialized within a given society. So how do we get to feminist frequencies conclusions? I see four basic possibilities. Reinforcing stereotypes, possibility number one, an overgeneralization plus a radical inference. This woman in this movie is acting as a caregiver, therefore that's typical of all women, therefore this is the way women are at their very core. Confirmation bias fuel, something like, oh look at her, she's acting as a caregiver, yup, I knew women were caregivers at their very core, it's what I already believed, there's confirmation of it. Three, the message is. Number four, something I'm missing, or as Donald Rumsfeld would put it, an unknown unknown. The first is accusing the audience of poor reasoning. We could draw all sorts of radical conclusions on the same basis, such as, well, Natalie Portman's character likes the shins, therefore all women like the shins, therefore women love the shins at their very core. She doesn't make a case for the third, except for in her straw feminist video, and the fourth I can't really comment on. This leaves the second. The problem with the second example is that any female character acting in any way stereotypically feminine is confirmation bias fuel who, for those who already hold an essentialist view of gender. The problem lies with their pre-existing belief. Moreover, returning to the issue of interpretation, when we combine interpretation with confirmation bias fuel, the result can make even feminist frequency herself seem like a hypocrite. Take the stereotype that feminists are man-haters. To be clear, I do not think that feminist frequency is a man-hater. But what if someone who already had that notion in their head about feminists, and then they saw clips like this? For centuries, male filmmakers, writers, painters, artists of all kinds have often cited women as the inspiration for their brilliant masterpieces. I swear, if I hear one more story like this, I'm going to scream. Or puke. Or both. Even though this may seem like a bit of a stretch, statements like this might confirm for the feminist man-hater believers that feminists are man-haters. Don't think anyone would interpret her as a man-hater? Boy, are you wrong. She is saying things which, given a certain interpretation, in the mind of someone with a certain bias, reinforces the stereotype that feminists are man-haters. So, feminist frequency, stop perpetuating the stereotype that feminists are man-haters. But I should be charitable to feminist frequency here. After all, as I have already explained, social forces can act to promote certain interpretations over others. The orthodox interpretation of the tortoise and the hare is that slow and steady wins the race, and groupthink leads to denominations and sects of religion rather than every believer having their own individual interpretation. Gender essentialism is, in spite of the challenges of sociology and feminism, still a relatively orthodox view within society. This means that while other interpretations are possible than that women are caregivers at their very core, that belief is one that is more likely in the mind of the average audience member. In other words, claiming that it is the normative view of society. An example of this would be if someone in America came up to you and asked if you believe in God. Theoretically, this could mean any number of gods, or it could mean any number of definitions of the idea of God. God is love, God is the universe, etc. But more than likely, the person asking you is a Christian, and the God they have in mind is Yahweh. The problem is that is not an avenue you should expect to be examined or explored when you watch feminist frequency videos. This is a problem of framing which I will return to in the last video in this series. Moreover, the way that she does frame the issues, one might think that the interpretation she spells out is the only one that could be drawn, but it's not. Another option would be to return to the message of the story is. The Bible does not merely imply that women should be subservient to men. It states it in a prescriptive fashion. But it would be very difficult to argue when it comes to manic pixies and evil demon seductresses that these stories are trying to tell us that's the way all women really are. And if that's the case, then society is sending us some pretty contradictory messages. Hmm. 
women are caregivers at their very core out to control and manipulate men. What movie does that remind me of? Moreover, in order to promote the view that the behavior of these females is typical of their gender, the audience would have to overgeneralize from these characters to women in general. Otherwise, we would be right back at the, at the normative view that I just outlined. But rather than be merely hypothetically charitable, looking at feminist frequency videos in a non-linear fashion, some picture of her actual view comes into focus. And so, through the magic of non-linear editing, I present to you with what I view as the four pillars of feminist frequency. First, that media is a reflection of society. I think it's important to critically engage with video games and comic books and movies and TV shows because it's a reflection of our society. I think that there's a lot of negative stereotypes and stories in the media that work to amplify and perpetuate oppressive social norms. It's important to remember that these comics don't exist in a vacuum, that they're created by artists and writers who live in the same sex as social systems that we all do, and that's reflected in the characters and the stories. Second, stories shape our worldview. Although many factors influence our socialization, such as families and peer groups, schools and churches, the media plays a highly critical role. I think that popular culture is a common language that we all speak. The poet Muriel Reichsire wrote that the universe is made up of stories, not of atoms, and I really like that quote because I feel like pop culture is one of the ways that we learn about ourselves and the world around us. This trope can't be brushed off as just entertainment. Human beings from the beginning of verbal storytelling have used narratives to understand ourselves and the world around us. When we hear a story repeated enough times, it can affect the way we think about reality. Third, looking for systematic patterns helps us make sense of the media. The test helps us identify the lack of relevant and meaningful female roles as a larger pattern in the film industry as a whole. The problem isn't restricted to any individual movie, director, or genre. When I call it a systemic problem, what I mean by this is that it's not just a few people here and there that don't like women or don't want women's stories told, but that rather the entire industry is built upon creating films and movies that cater to and that are about men. Women in Refrigerators is one way of making sense of this incredibly complex world by pulling out overarching patterns of the way women are treated in comic books. Showing groups of men engaging in this behavior repeatedly over many advertising campaigns creates a space in which patriarchal norms are encouraged and promoted. It's a tired old, all women need is a man myth. We see this disturbing message embedded in Hollywood movies, especially in romantic comedies, where it essentially serves as the backbone of the entire genre. Fourth, looking at asymmetries can highlight inequalities within society. When Simone released her list in 1999, there was an instant backlash from some comic book fans who thought it was unfair that they were singling out female characters. This criticism happens whenever we point out tropes specifically about women. In this case, comic book fans criticized women in refrigerators by saying that male heroes get killed and tortured too, so what's the big deal? The people who run the Women in Refrigerators website responded to this by creating another trope – how much do I love fans <laughs> – called Dead Men Defrosting. Comic fan John Bartle explains, in cases where male heroes have been altered or appear to die, they usually come back even better than before, either power-wise or in terms of character development relevancy to the reader. In response to the Bechdel test, I'm often asked, well, what about the reverse? Why isn't there a test to determine if two men talk to each other about something other than a woman? The answer to that is simple. The test is meant to indicate a problem, and there isn't a problem with a lack of men interacting with one another. The Bechdel test is useful because it can point out an institutional pattern, and since there's no problem with men and men's stories being underrepresented in films, the reverse test is useless and irrelevant. The pattern of presenting women as fundamentally weak, ineffective, or ultimately incapable has larger ramifications beyond the characters themselves and the specific games they inhabit. We have to remember that these games don't exist in a vacuum. They are an increasingly important and influential part of our larger social and cultural ecosystem. The reality is, this trope is being used in a real-world context where backward sexist attitudes are already rampant. It's a sad fact that a large percentage of the world's population still clings to the deeply sexist belief that women as a group need to be sheltered, protected, and taken care of by men. The belief that women are somehow a naturally weaker gender is a deeply ingrained socially constructed myth, which of course is completely false, but the notion is reinforced and perpetuated when women are continuously portrayed as frail, fragile, and vulnerable creatures. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that all games that use the damsel in distress as a plot device are automatically sexist or have no value. 
But it's undeniable that popular culture is a powerful influence in our lives, and the damsel in distress trope as a recurring trend does help to normalize extremely toxic, patronizing, and paternalistic attitudes about women. Approximation, these are true observations and a valid method. It also answers certain basic questions about what she's attempting to do. Why the media? Because it reflects society and its narratives shape our worldview. How can we make sense of the media? Look for patterns. When are patterns relevant and worth critiquing? When they show an asymmetry that points to an inequality in our society. However, my main problem with Feminist Frequency's method is her relentless focus on the media oversimplifies things a bit too much. Let's replay a clip. When we hear a story repeated enough times, it can affect the way we think about reality. This is something of a vague statement, but everything we experience influences our worldview even if only in a minute way. What she seems to be implying is that people form their beliefs on what they hear repeated most often. But unless you want to equate people with parrots, I think we all recognize that things are not that simple. People's worldviews are largely based on their education and rely heavily on who they interpret to be authority figures. People are also capable of reasoning for themselves and can ignore or discount what they know to be factually wrong or illogical. In other words, no matter how many times something is said, if you know it to be wrong, you will not believe it. Returning to all the philosophical mumbo jumbo at the beginning of this video, people derive their worldview from a variety of different sources. Remember this clip? Although many factors influence our socialization, such as families and peer groups, schools and churches, all of these other sources not only heavily influence our worldview, but in turn mediate the way we understand and interpret media. Every viewer brings their own worldview and bias, so different people can come to radically different conclusions. This movie was totally about the glories of free market capitalism. Are you completely insane? This movie was clearly about the Marxist struggle of the proletariat. Even when we can point in the media as having an impact on people's worldview, other factors play a highly critical role. Examine the straw feminist for a second. The straw feminist is set up to perpetuate and advance the myth that feminism is no longer needed, that we've arrived at gender equality, and anyone who disagrees is quickly demeaned and portrayed as an extremist. This trope represents a backlash against feminism and groups supporting women's rights. As we make more gains towards equality, the backlash gets stronger. It's an old yet effective tactic, but clearly it's working because I often hear young women saying, I believe in the equal rights of women, but I'm not a feminist. This sentiment is a direct result of the straw feminist trope, because women want to distance themselves from the extreme and false representations they're seeing in TV, movies, and talk shows. Clearly the media does play a role in perpetuating the straw feminist, but why do young women want to distance themselves from what they see on TV? And I'm gonna guess that pointing out sexism isn't exactly popular with the guys. We also have to look at peer groups for a couple of reasons. First, because it is not merely the media pushing this idea, but also everyday people as well. When a peer group is constantly ridiculing feminism, then saying, I believe in the equal rights of women, but I'm not a feminist, becomes an act of conformity. Part of the sad truth about this trope is that it is not drawn out of thin air. The girls are influenced by femme fatale's malicious rhetoric to see benign, routine, everyday things as a conspiracy against women and against them personally. Now why would anyone think that feminists have it out for Barbie? So LEGO spent four years and millions of dollars to research the desires of girls to create another Barbie wasteland. The ads are actively demonstrating that boys and girls have different social roles and skills that are highly stereotyped and just outright sexist. How easy someone is to straw man is inversely proportional to the subtlety and complexity of what they're trying to say. Youth may have a hard time recognizing that these commercials are teaching them what is expected, what is desired, and what is possible for their genders, for their careers, for love, relationships, and creative endeavors in the future. The second reason we should look at peer groups is because they are possibly even a larger conveyor of the straw feminist than TV, movies, and radio. Much of this is coming from social media, of course, but social media does not have the same sort of institutional structures as traditional media. Finally, peer influence has more persuasion power than traditional media because as a source of information, it is typically perceived as less biased and tainted with an agenda. In other words, if friends and or bloggers are telling 
them that feminism is ridiculous, they are more likely to believe that than a television show telling them. While it's difficult to quantify the exact influence of the media, there are a couple of places we can look to put light on the issue. First is media violence. Whenever a national tragedy happens nowadays, it seems like the political discourse splits between people on the left blaming guns and people on the right blaming violent video games and other media. In fact, violence in the media may be one of the most heavily scrutinized aspects of media. What the studies show, however, is not in any sense straightforward. While countless people claim a straightforward causal link between violent media and violent behavior, studies show at best a correlation, and correlation does not equal causation. Other studies have questioned there being a link between viewing of pornography and people's actual behavior, and so forth. Empirical studies tend not to lend ringing endorsement to the notion that media has a significant impact on the way people think and behave. Another way to look at the issue of reinforcing stereotypes would be to ask the relationship between the prevalence of a view in popular culture and how widely it is held by the public. Hypothetically, if a view stops being promoted by the mainstream media, then it will diminish within society. So what about the view that the world is 6,000 years old and other creationist views? In the realm of popular culture, creationism has pretty much been routed. Even bad science fiction movies give a scientific cosmology. TV and movies overwhelmingly stick to the idea that the universe is billions of years old and that life came about through evolution. So evolution is a widely held view and creationism is totally out on the fringe of society, right? It's not. A, a disturbingly high percentage of the US population believes in creationism. Millions of people believe that the world is only 6,000 years old? Can I seek intellectual asylum in Australia? How this could be is that other institutions, such as organized religion, actively promote young earth creationism. Religion has a strong impact on the views of millions of people within our society, including their views on women. Arguably, on the list of influences she mentioned, media might be at the bottom in terms of impact. Its ubiquity gives the illusion that the situation is otherwise. Let's move away from feminist frequency for just a second and look at Richard Dawkins going all skeptical frequency on the X-Files. We can see the same approach at work and the same ambiguities as well. In response to the idea that the show is just entertainment, Dawkins says, and I'll spare you my attempt at a British accent, quote, a fair defense you might think, but soap operas, cop series, and the like are justly criticized if, week after week, they ram home the same prejudice or bias. Each week, the X-Files poses a mystery and offers two rival kinds of explanation the rational theory and the paranormal theory. And week after week, the rational explanation loses. But it's only fiction, a bit of fun. Why get so hot under the collar? Imagine a crime series in which every week there was a white suspect and a black suspect. And every week, lo and behold, the black one turns out to have done it unpardonable, of course. And my point is that you could not defend it by saying, but it's only fiction, only entertainment, end quote. In other words, what Richard Dawkins is claiming is that the X-Files reinforces belief in the supernatural. But again, we have to examine the relationship between the show and the audience. I personally am both a skeptic and a fan of the X-Files. William B. Davis, the actor who played the cigarette smoking man, is also a skeptic. Link in the description. I watched the show thinking that in reality, Scully is right and Mulder is a jackass, but I accept that the fictional universe of the show operates otherwise. On the other hand, the Heaven's Gate cult, which are the people who committed mass suicide when they believed that they'd be taken up to a spaceship hidden behind hale Bob Comet, reportedly stoked their beliefs by watching shows like Star Trek and The X-Files. This would seem to confirm the danger of reinforcing belief in the supernatural. But again, we must bear in mind that this was a cult, and watching science fiction about aliens was just part of the indoctrination into their belief system. So what are we left with? Complexity and ambiguity, which does not really lend itself to pithy statements like the harmful misogynist myth that this trope reinforces. Lastly, assuming you have not already tuned out of this video, I want to comment on the pitfalls 
of examining tropes. Anytime you group something together, you run the risk of the fallacy of composition. In my video, Anita vs. the Amazons, I argue that although Why the Last Man included straw feminists, what she said about the construction and agenda of the straw feminist trope did not hold true in the case of Why the Last Man. The fallacy of composition is to assume that something is true of the whole based on some of its parts. Because all analysis of tropes involves looking at things in terms of a group, make sure that what you are saying about a trope is true of everything you claim to be part of the trope. Second, a pattern or possible effect of a story should not be confused with the author's intentions. Feminist Frequency runs afoul of this a couple of times. Hollywood has a long history of making queer characters monsters and sociopaths and murderers who have no moral compass. This trope is used in order to reinforce a fear of homosexuality. As I have already argued in my video, Anita and the disturbing evil of Sam Adama, there is little evidence to suggest that the writers are trying to promote a fear of homosexuality. Writers are using the women in refrigerators trope to literally trade a female character's life for the benefit of a male character's story arc. They're making clear that women, even powerful female superheroes, are basically disposable. The problem here is that the women in refrigerators trope was arrived at by looking at a pattern of writing, but in this clip she is insinuating that it is something the writers are doing deliberately. Writers probably don't sit down and saying, which trope am I going to use today? More likely this comes out of story logic. Women in Refrigerators is a subcategory of revenge stories. Killing off a female character is one of the logical branches of an overarching idea. Women in Refrigerators is one of the many possible variations. It becomes a pattern because it is a node in a tree of logical possibilities and psychologically salient motives for revenge. You might take revenge against someone because they tried to kill you, or you might take revenge against the people that are trying to commit genocide against your people, or you might take revenge against the people who enslaved you and took your wife. And that's just Quentin Tarantino movies. The death of a female character is one possible catalyst for revenge. You killed my partner, you bastard! He had one day left to retirement! The moral connotations are that people will feel sympathy and thus pathos, and we all know how writers love evoking pathos. If we as a society regarded women as disposable, then we would not sympathize with a man's desire to take revenge. Why women are usually the victims might have more to do with male writers writing for a male audience. Another pattern she talks about. Pointing out patterns itself is valid, but blaming writers is suspect. RC and Transformers, now that's treating a female character as disposable. Also, try and avoid any sort of fallacy in general, such as the slippery slope. Here, I came up with my own example. Feminist Frequency's criticism of violent entertainment is particularly striking at this point in history as entertainment is come under vicious attack by right-wing and religious groups who want censorship and a return to the Hays Code. So, Feminist Frequency, you should feel real bad right now for enabling the right-wing censors. So in conclusion, Feminist Frequency attempts to make concise and pithy points like This trope is used in order to reinforce But nothing is quite that simple. This seeming lack of complexity in her videos might be part of the fact that they are videos, which is something I will discuss in the last video of this series, so stay tuned.